the person in honor of whom we have this conference, Tamir Pardo. Tamir Pardo is a Jerusalemite, graduate of the Tel Aviv University Law Department. What happened? Okay, now it's okay. Uh, inter alia in the Matkal unit, and he happened to visit Uganda under certain circumstances as a liaison during the Antebe operation. His career, of course, is covered, and we can't say too much about it, apart from describing that since he was uh, enlisted to the Mossad in the 80s, went through the entire process from a minor to the head of the pyramid, got the Israel Security Prize three times. I understand that you are about to get uh, the uh, governance knighthood prize. This is really attractive. Uh, the is, I think altogether, uh, it's fascinating how people who deal with security in the world of shadows all their lives, they develop, their personality develops so that the things that we want him to talk about are ethical considerations. In other words, what we hope that Tamir will be able to benefit us here in the Institute. Avi Noam, who is here with us, at the time he established a geopolitical group that works under the radar, basically, with the very significant people headed by Avi Gil and Mike Herzog. Mike was appointed Israel ambassador in Washington, and the idea is that Tamir, together with Avi, will take this group forward. We're planning to develop this wonderful idea that Avi Noam brought and to add some elements, and perhaps also, I hope, we'll be able to develop here led by Tamir, zero strategical thoughts. How do we preserve the Jewish and democratic nature of the state given the conflict? How certain aspects or certain scenario of a possible future can bring about results that will preserve more or less uh, the relationship between Jewish and democratic. Tamil, the floor is yours. Well, let's get on with it. When Professor Stern approached me with the idea to lecture about ethical considerations in this Israel foreign policy, it has to do with the issue of Russia-Ukraine war. In our short phone call, it seemed to me that it's quite simple. The more the time arrived, I wanted to pick up a phone and to say, let's give it up, let's forget it. It's a waste of time. It's complicated, it's complex. And the more I delved into it, I realized that it was more and more complex and complicated than uh, what met the eye initially. And unfortunately, when you see the last presentation, it can also confuse us. And I hope it does confuse us, because such a complex issue, you have to ask the questions very well. Otherwise, uh, it can take you to very undesired places. Because um, the, if it's really what I saw, then we we're in great trouble, more than I thought. Who am I uh, among all these uh, very distinguished people here? I'm not a philosopher. And I agree that it's desired that in the society there will be a philosopher, not a legalist and not an historian. I'm not an academic, but I'm definitely not a politician. I'll try, with my limited uh, forces, from my point of view, to shed a little light on uh, this issue and to show you how complex I think it is. I'm not going to go into, especially after the first panel, to try and define what is ethics, what is moral. But uh, it has to do with uh, norms that b b distinguish between good and evil, 
on a very high level and the behavior rules that are norms in the world perception of a society and some of them are backed by legislation of do and not do. This is in the family, the tribe, the state. But when we go to relations between state, that's a completely different uh, ball game. Actually, in the court of international relations, it's too cha chaotic. There's no president or king who can enforce rules on all the countries, although in the 20th century, uh, after the First World War, there were all sorts of attempts to consolidate um, general norms, uh, games in a global arena, very little success. And you can see how many countries did not uh, join this uh, international court. And in Hague, for example, you can see who didn't join. Not everybody that doesn't join is considered a dictatorship. But uh, the power also has some role in the game in deciding what's good and bad, what's allowed and what's not. In the modern world, 20, 21st century, we don't focus enough. We are in an era of a incredible technological revolution. It's already three decades. We now live in a global village. What it means is, maybe it's not clear to all the heads of state and lead the world to the world to where place that they want to lead it to, the state structure is old and the world is now a village with very complicated problems. And the challenge is very difficult for politics in any country. Transparency, which is almost the total actually blurs uh, the differences between external and internal politics. It didn't happen in the past. I can give you an example. At a time when the Arab Spring began, uh, parallel to me from a very, very big country and very far country, came to me and he said to me, you know, the first night after the riots in the Tahrir Square in Cairo, we blocked the uh, access to uh, of the internet, everything that has to do with Egypt. And I said to him, you know, I think uh, people don't know that there is such a country as Egypt. Nobody knows that there are riots there in the country you're speaking of. He says, internet enables a comprehensive look. And in anybody wants to see anything, he will find it that it's enough that in a city of 50,000 inhabitants, I will have some riot, it's going to sweep the whole country, although I'm quite sure that anybody who is going to see it won't even know where that country is and when is that, where is that small city. Uh, walking between the drops, I want to give you some examples to decisions and to see if they were ethical or not. Individual vis-a-vis -vis state, state vis-a-vis -vis its own law, decisions of a state as a mirror to its power or weakness. How do we um, test the interests of a state and the tension between politics and uh, army? The first test case is simple enough. A married couple, the husband abuses the wife. A verbal violence, but also a little bit of a physical violence. The woman who feels threatened decided one night to do something. After her husband uh, fell asleep, she took a gun and she shot him dead while he was sleeping. The state decided to indict the woman for murder. United States it's easy to talk about something else. The United States was looking for Osama bin Laden for many, many years so that he will pay for the attacks that he ordered as the leader of Al-Qaeda. After years, the American intelligence detected, instead of asking the Pakistani government to detain him and to extradite him to the United States, they decided to violate the sovereignty of its ally 
to go on a military operation to kill Bin Laden in his bed. And for that, the United States uh, was blessed by the entire freedom-seeking world as a very moral act. There are two events here. As a citizen of a state, uh, the detention of the woman and uh, convicting here is uh, perceived as correct, although we know how many abuse uh, um, usually of the husbands ended with the uh, murder of the woman. We have law and order and that's the way we have to live. Such events, when they are in the, in the national arena, then within the organization from which I come, they will never raise a toast for such an event, but this is an event that is legitimate. It is perceived as an ethical, moral act to do. Same uh, to those people who were there, I think, of the strong left. Nobody would say a word after the Bin Laden thing. Food for thought. The second event, like the decision to release Gilad Shalit, for a long time Israel negotiated for the release of Gilad Shalit, who was abducted by the Hamas in uh, for 2006. The one who led uh, this was his family. They crossed every ocean. They arrived everywhere in the world and it sat strongly on the veins of the government of Israel in order to release him no matter what. In 2012, the state of Israel agreed, the government rather, to sign a contract with the Hamas, but for Gilad, 1,027 terrorists were released, 280 were life sentence for murder and atrocious deeds. I remember the days uh, before the decision of the government and conversations I had with the PM. The PM justifiably so, he knew that this is a very, very harsh decision for any prime minister and definitely somebody from the right. The Prime Minister was looking for the support of the operative uh, left zone, the Mossad, Shabak, IDF. And I remember saying to him, and I wasn't the only one, very, very small conversations, I said to him, this is a crazy price, no question. There's no logic whatsoever, operative or logical, to agree to such an idea. And I said to him also that the question is not legitimate. As far as I'm concerned, as a professional, unless he's re ready to detach all the operative um, components, even the legal, to release um, en masse murderers, assassinate, who didn't even pay a small price, and to actually, this is a Jewish moral question only. Why is he asking me? He can uh, pick up the phone to my wife and ask her the same question, because what she's going to tell him is not different than what I can going to tell him if we're talking about ethics. I said to him, I agree to support it, because I knew there's no other option. No operation uh, uh, option, the only alternative is to let him die in the caption of Hamas. The personal moral decision of the Prime Minister was derived from a Jewish morality, and uh, this brought about to release the murderers. Did it uh, stand up to the test of international relations? Is this perhaps a weakness or maybe even um, possibility for blackmail later? I can remind you that a short time before Protective Edge in 2014, there was a discussion in the cabinet in a committee that was called the Shambar Committee. It was appointed eight years beforehand to discuss this entire issue of what Israel does in times of abductions. It is uh, covered until today. It's confidential. It wasn't exposed. But there was a discussion in the cabinet and the government wanted to adopt it. It was very convenient. Remember, we're talking about two years after the Shalit uh, return, a lot of criticism in Israel from pole to pole. And here you see Shamgar with his very distinguished committee gave a solution. Solution very similar to the American solution. And your humble servant, when I had to speak, I said to the prime minister, I suggest to you not to make a decision. 
Everybody is sitting there, looking. What can we say to this guy from the Mossad? And I said, I would like to know whether... Now, if you pick up a phone and you hear that three girls were abducted in Judea and Samaria from some uh, juncture and they, they want to negotiate for their release, otherwise they're going to do something terrible. I said to him, I'm not sure that if you adopt now the decisions of the Shambhaka Committee, you'll be able to withstand one hour facing the Israeli public, how you don't live up to the decisions that you yourself made a day before. I don't know if following that, but the decision was postponed, and a week later, those three young boys were kidnapped, and we know the result. Namely, when we talk about tension, maybe that in, in 1948, you know, those laws and basic uh, foundations and the first opportunity it happened, would we create something that is similar to the American approach in this event with all the pain and all the sorrow of families whose sons are in that uh, distress and apparently will not come back home, Maybe then we could have done something, but Israel chose the Jewish morality as opposed to the state interest and as opposed also to general ethical norms. Can you reintroduce into the terror cycle 280 assassins that will soon meet in our streets? Most likely, we cannot. But uh, if we talk about release of captives, pidyon shuim, in our tradition, maybe it's stronger than anything else. And in this example, you can see that it is really a complex business. You have to remember also that uh, we were taken advantage of by that, because not recently, if somebody remembers uh, the event of Naama Yisachar, again, it started in Russia, out of an idea that some hacker, instead of getting the United States and being judged there, will go back to Russia. They took a very, very small event, turned it into something enormous. And when they realized that the game, the play with Americans is not going to work, then they asked for all sorts of discounts here in Jerusalem. And they wanted all sorts of sacred places and holy sites of the Russian uh, um, the, the church, uh, but the, the government actually couldn't really do it legally, but nevertheless they promised to return it back. So Russia actually caught us in the most painful point in that the, the prime minister had to fly personally to release a woman who at the end of the day uh, wasn't exactly innocent. Uh, they didn't detain her. Okay, they wanted to give her a punishment that wasn't fit, but nevertheless uh, but what, a prime, prime minister with a wife go to Moscow on a plane to bring her as a hero to the country? The third case I'm uh, cautious. The Holocaust of the, or the genocide of the Armenian people, to be more accurate. The State of Israel refuses constantly to recognize the Holocaust of the Armenian people and the responsibility of Turkey. The explanation the government gives for decades, all the governments, it's the national interest of Israel to preserve the relations with Turkey, a regional superpower that the contact is, is a strategic um, and, um, important thing. The NATO states that are partners to Turkey from day one, they do recognize the Armenian Holocaust. Belgium, Canada, Bel German, France, and in 1921, even the United States recognized them. In a very strange way, and we can only guess why, even Lebanon and Syria already recognized it. When this dilemma uh, evokes between the security issue and ethics, always, always the politics and the security wins over. Why? Why this case of Gilad Shalit uh, releasing a captive was the most important for to do, but in the Armenian Holocaust, the interest is higher than the morality. I think that it has 
some idea for solution. The Jewish people felt uh, very um, tentatively the results of the tension between a moral stand and adopting the political interest, which makes you shut your eyes, a rotten compromise, somebody said before, and looking to the side that in these two cakes, who knows what could have happened otherwise. Sometimes by giving up the uh, ethical stand, you have to pay a much higher price later on. A year and a half uh, before the breakout of the Second World War, Germany annexed Austria. The Anschluss was against the Versailles Accord and everybody was silent. A year before the war, Chamberlain in his uh, State uh, of the Union speech said how terrible, imaginative is the fact that we will have to dig trenches and to put on gas masks here in England because of a fight in some remote country between people we know nothing about. It seems that it's impossible, but uh, that uh, fight that was already, that it should be a casus belli. And this is what happened in the Sudeten. It's convenient for me to look at the local interest. It's convenient for me to do the rotten compromise. But the price was paid by England as well, a crazy price. So let's leave the world for a second. Let's talk about that speaker. And in, if, if not for all sorts of events, it's not uh, so sure that if Britain could have survived anyway. The Jews in Germany felt the Nazi regime before that, from 1933. Six years before the war, in 35, the Nuremberg laws were enacted in the parliament, not uh, in gutters. Anybody who looks at these laws, the Nuremberg laws, in the eyes of today, uh, I wasn't alive then, of course, you should say, wait a minute, how come the world did not uh, wake up? This is, we saw where it was going. We're talking about a state within the middle of Europe. And then in March 38, before the war, Switzerland closed administratively its gates to Jewish refugees from Austria and later on also from Germany, where the national interest of Switzerland was uh, not uh, fit to load Switzerland with the Jewish refugees. Administrative decisions. The European countries and the states did not change the quota of uh, immigration. Uh, uh, Britain, their interests in the Middle East was clear, uh, stopped the gates to European Jews, not just before the war, but during, but also after, after they knew about the Holocaust. And then we come to, 19, to, to, to 2022, the state of Israel, the state of the Jewish people. And that's the most important part in our understanding and connecting to reality. The state of Israel today is a regional superpower. It has a security system which is professional and great at any scale. I'm not talking about the states or Russia or China, but if we talk about the size of the army and the security system, we have a huge system in all scales. A state that is independent, strong economy, number 17 in the world in the um, GNP, 151,000 dollars, startup nations, cyber, medicine, agriculture, health, a rich and blossoming state. This is not the state of Israel of the 50s and the 60s, where existence was dubious. The peace agreements for years already with Egypt and Jordan in the northeast Syria, which is completely shattered from a decade of civil war that uh, destroyed it completely. And on the north, we have some country uh, that is bankrupt for years, Lebanon. 
We have uh, some uh, symmetries from uh, Gaza, from the earth, but they have no, no power whatsoever, which is even close to a state. Uh, they're both very weak. In the second and third circle, we have peace agreements with the Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, and I think later on it'll be with Saudi Arabia and other countries that are even further where we had no connections at the time. Now it's almost completely in the open. And yes, we have Iran a thousand kilometers from the border with the activities in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. They help the Hamas. In any case, it's not even close to the threat that we experienced in the Yom Kippur War in 73, not to mention 67. Apart from a future nuclear threat from Iran, which the whole world is interested for, there's no real threat outside of the borders of this country. And I don't want intentionally to go to the, all the internal uh, feuds. Even in nuclear, we were in a most complicated and dangerous situation with Iraq or Syria, because then we were alone in the battlefield, especially in Iraq, with the nuclear and also in Syria. But today, to many people in the international community, the state of Israel is just another state, like any other. It's not a weakling uh, that is existential, is, is, is existence is dubious. Therefore, it should stick to norms and morality ethics. The state of Israel benefited from a lot of discounts over the years. Eldad said, give us time to uh, get over the Holocaust. It's over, it's finished, and we should understand that. It's just over. Because we are not uh, a weakling, we are a superpower in any scale. We're one of the richest countries in the world, developed. And when I hear those people who meet with Saudis or Emiratics or my conversations today, not when I was in office, their point of view, we identify you as partners. We want it. You are a strong country. You are independent, a state that can contribute to the region. When I saw some of the questions here and the answers in the survey, what I think about is that those who answer these questions are living in the movie of 1966. Saturday afternoon, 1973, rather than 2022. And a caveat, the world has no patience when somebody tries to relate, not proportionally to the place where it lives. And you can pay a heavy price for that. And then I don't know how all sorts of tables will look if we do that. There is an interest here that at least from my point of view, I want to try to present us all the time, not as a weakling, as a nebech, whose existence is doubtful and tomorrow morning it's going to disappear. And the question is how much we contribute to this by ourselves. My mother is 93 years old. She's a Holocaust survivor, alone from the entire family. Nobody was left. And she says to me, for many years, she says to me, and it happened when her grandchildren, my kids, got to an age that they went to uh, Poland to see the um, extermination camps. She says to me, why in hell do they go there? It is dead this past. Let them go to Israel. Why do you need every day to see this disaster? We have a state. It cannot happen here, no way. 
don't we instill something in our own heads that actually tomorrow morning it can happen again? And the heaps of shoes in Auschwitz are going to be seen here tomorrow morning? When uh, it goes in, injected into your body, it means something. And this meaning you can see here, it's not connected to left or to right, it's a mistake. Because if you talk and underscore with these people those questions and some things are conflicting and you can imagine where the answers are coming from, and when the Israeli politicians for years from all segments and all walks of society keep preaching to the young generation year after year that the existence here is not sure. There's no wonder that sometimes you can see that from this interest or another you can agree to give up the basic principles of the people that the Bible is his and the moral ethics world is the foundation. These days we are seeing something that we thought was the past. Russia superpower started eight years ago to create a narrative and that's the problem. You see now let's notice the Russian narrative as one who served at the head of the Mossad and I could visit Russia more than once every visit whether with the first or the third, the great patriotic war was the narrative of the Russian people. Although almost four generations passed, we're talking about uh, uh, people who, it, it's there, it's in their eyes. You come to the grave of the uh, um, unknown soldier and you visit, the same visits that we do in Yad Vashem. And it's there, it's indebted in that. I was told by a friend, an American friend, who was a senior officer in the state and he's a veteran for years. He visited, uh, uh, veterans were visiting Moscow to meet uh, their parallels. People at the age of 60, 70, like me, we were born very much later than the Second World War, and they meet with their parallels and they bring them to the higher command school for officers in, the, in Russia. And just think about it, you know, there are basically kids. Uh, they're officers, but they're 30, 35 years old. They're already colonels, lieutenant colonels. And there's a discussion between them or a talk. And they say, you Americans, you did not live up to your agreement in the Second World War. And you opened the Second Front only in June 44. And those people they spoke to, their fathers maybe participated in the Second World War. Maybe not. Maybe their grandparents. We're talking about people of 30, 35 years old, but it's inside them. That's what they believe in. Now, when we talk about the Russian narrative today, what do they say? What do they... These are Nazis. These are Nazis. And this is the narrative for the Great Patriotic War. Moreover, there's as an ambition for the Ukraine to develop nuclear weapons, they say. If there is such an ambition, it means an existential threat on Russia. An 18-year-old soldier, a commander of a unit that goes out to war, and he is told that this is a protecting, this is a defense war. Already in uh, the gun, if there's a house there, then it's not clear because they're talking about urban fights. If there's blood or something, we look at it from the side. We talk about war crimes. 
But what dictates to those soldiers is the narrative that they drank with their mother's milk. So now we're in a very, very complicated problem, which means that the narrative is part of the rules of the game. When we are convinced that we are just 100%, and the ones in facing us symbolizes evil and danger, then that area between the sacred spaces was discussed here, and how much is allowed and how much is not, all this goes down the drain. The Western world described the, the Russian process as aggression. And we have to remember that after the event of the Crimea, Israel didn't uh, condemn or join or do anything. Nothing against Russia. And we'll ask ourselves why. From the day of invasion that started in March or last February, Israel chose to sit on the fence and talked about security interests. And the prime minister estimated that because of his ties with Putin, he can become a mediator, a broker, out of a world perception that Israel can benefit from both worlds. The position of the states and all the other Western countries, all the pictures and the um, videos we saw in real time at the beginning almost didn't change uh, the uh, position of the Americans. The opposition here in the Knesset was silent altogether. Usually that's the time that the opposition can really challenge a government when we talk about these things. But it doesn't exist now. Not one discussion was held in the Knesset about this event. And the request of Zelensky uh, on Zoom when he wanted to speak uh, in the Knesset, finally it was rejected, but then it was a bit strange that he did it not to the Knesset. Official condemnations were not heard. The government of Israel refused to send even helmets or, um, or vests, or close vests. And um, um, the UN uh, condemned, but the reaction was very interesting on behalf of the Russian foreign minister who spoke about the uh, Hitler legacy and that in fact he was Jewish somewhere, just to understand the rules of the game and what court you're playing on. In uh, the sanctions, uh, official Israel decided not to participate and the only ones who actually are uh, over careful at Israeli banks that they know if they do something stupid at that uh, moment they'll face a problem of existence. So they're very cautious, very careful. Israel continues until today to walk between the drops. We're talking all the time about security interests that cannot make us take a stand. But as for the refugees, Israel is not far, unfortunately, from the behavior of Switzerland during that, before the war, the gate is open to Jews, but proven Jews, I want to stress, proven Jews because of the law of return. But those who are not Jewish, the Israel puts difficulties until today, it did not open its gates to anybody who is asylum seeker, because as was said, haven, or asylum doesn't mean citizenship or a passport or Israeli ID or voting to the Knesset. Asylum can be for half a year or five years in, in a state that imports tens of thousands a year from the Far East and other countries to all sorts of uh, economic 
reasons. Some of them remain here after that. It was difficult to open the gates for this country. I think it's a shame, a disgrace. If we talk about uh, entry to Jews or not Jews, my mother had a friend who was a professor in a university in France, social work. And she said to her one day, she said, you know why there's such anti-Semitism? She said, look, there's a joint house, there's a joint house in France of the middle class. And you have to help a family. The Jew has no problem to help another Jew in the next city. And if he has his last penny, he will give it to a Jew in another city rather to, to his neighbor next door, because he's not Jewish. Something that came up here and surfaced in one of the... Where do we put ourselves? Is morality something that distinguishes between a Jew and a non-Jew? If the answer is yes, we have a problem. I think so. The State of Israel took similar steps for the same reasons that the countries before the Second World War did, even before the, the destruction of the Holocaust. We're not looking at, at the end in hindsight, but think, think of what happened in 38, 39, and what happened in 40, when they didn't realize that it was going to be a Holocaust. And their behavior was atrocious because of interests. On the 13th of March, the municipality of Jerusalem decided uh, to hang the flags of Russia and the Ukraine and the city all over because we are sort of neutral. That was their thought. Only when there was a protest against this, they took off the flags. In general, until today, Israel is trying to walk between the drops and not to stand aside uh, in the Ukraine formally um, and uh, the international world is against it and the Israelis are indifferent. That's what you saw in the questionnaire. I'm not judging the security uh, considerations but I want to understand uh, the importance that Israel gives uh, because of its freedom to hit uh, all sorts of targets in Syria against Iranian bases and entrenching. But at the same time, we should also understand what Russia is doing and to explain to the public what are the Russian interests. Russia, a long time before it based itself in Syria, shut its eyes to the delivery of Russian arms from the Syrian army to the Hezbollah. We knew that and they knew that we know. Shutting the eyes was a Russian strategy. Its interests were clear. Back to the Middle East. They want to go back to the Middle East after it was kicked out of there in the 80s. With the deployment of the Russian army in Syria and the full support of Moscow with Assad, with a massive supply of uh, arms, Syria became an experiment field for uh, weapons that you see today, the results in Kiev, in Kherson, and in all the other cities. How can you destroy very accurately if you have the right weapons inside a city? The Russian strategy did not prevent the bases of Iran in Syria. There was an overlap between the Russian interest and the Iranian interest. Israel succeeded to create an understanding that it is not going to hit any Russian interests in Syria, and Syria 
will not blink an eye of what Israel is doing against the Iranian. But there's no identity of interest between Israel and Syria and Syria. What we hear sometimes as if Russia is here, but that's why it's a threat, is correct, but not accurate. At the time, we were still weaklings. Before the Yom Kippur War, the generation, and Amos definitely remembers it, I wasn't in the army yet, the Soviet at the time were deployed in Egypt. They were active in the air uh, defense. They were the players. It was uh, the Soviet Union. They were the second superpower in the world, not Russia of today. And the Israeli security interest did not uh, fear from fighting aircraft of Russians. Today there's no such risk because Russia has no interest in that. And it's true, it's not the easiest, it's not the simplest. But the question is why did uh, Israel decided to sit on the fence and not to support totally its real ally Washington In order to answer it, I want to go back to the Armenian uh, issue, which I mentioned in the beginning. How is an interest or strategy stated in a democratic country? In the Armenian case, the position of the uh, professional echelon was the diplomatic relations between two countries. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs predicted that if we acknowledge the Armenian uh, de uh, genocide, um, the, the relationship between Israel and Turkey will be harmed to the point of that they will never recover. Turkey, according to its own perception of interest, uh, stood against Israel, against Israel when it came to the Palestinian issue. Um, we didn't, it didn't motivate us to change our position. So those were the interests and we were on the other side. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs fulfilled its mission loyally, but the role of a government is to calculate and see the broader picture. So moral values are very important components. The interest of the state is just not, it's not only in our perspective of the here and now, but we need to th also think about moral components when it comes to bilateral relationship. Currently, with the Ukraine and Russia situation, the position of the security establishment is really clear. There is no, there is no uh, uh, doubt that uh, we need to remain out of the discussion. So if I were in my previous role as the commander of the Air Force, I would ask them, what do you want? Do you want me to handle it? The easiest way to handle it is to fly above Syria and Russians letting me do it. If I need to ask the Russians, and I think about air force, air um, d defense systems, so we reach an understanding. Let's move from there. That's a completely legitimate position of the Air Force, of the Chief of Staff, of the security establishment. But the role of the Israeli government to include in this equation some other parameters, the relationship with the US, the relationship with NATO, an organization we have special relations with and thinking and we want to cooperate, grow to grow our cooperation as a result of other threats we are facing in this region. Nowadays, the Iranian issue, with all due respect, is at the international arena. U.S. position is highly important, and the European country's position is also important. So we also need to consider it. We need them. We will need them one of these days. But how do we behave today? So the question is whether the political echelon understand that when we consider the long term, we might be very sorry for, uh, for not reacting. 
and besides, what is the moral position that we are supposed to adapt? I'm not trying to judge the decisions that were made, but statements such as the security comes first, when it, so we need to re-examine them. So if we uh, actually support sanctions, it's very, it's very important step. We need to remember uh, the money we pay at the end. We might pay a very high price in the future. And here, with the economic aspect, economic sanctions, uh, it has nothing to do with the security interests in terms of supplying certain um, advantages to Ukraine. To sum up, morality and politics are not the same. Values and uh, moral uh, um, values are supposed to put us in the right positions. Israel of the 21st century needs to consider and make it part of its decision making. Thank you very much.